we've seen a very compelling, disturbing documentary, uh, a very moving uh, and urgent film. We're going to get an opportunity to have a conversation about it with three people that were responsible for the film. I'd like to introduce uh, our panel first, and then we can begin the conversation and take your questions and comments. Uh, this is going to be a very brief introduction. To introduce them properly it would take longer than the documentary in some ways. Uh, Lowell Bergman is the Reva and David Logan Distinguished Chair in Investigative Journalism, and he's also the Director of the Investigative Reporting Program at UC Berkeley's Graduate School of Journalism. Uh, he was a senior producer and consultant to PBS Frontline until 2015. Uh, in 2004, he received the Pulitzer Prize for Public Service, awarded to the New York Times for the documentary, A Dangerous Business. Uh, Lowell has received just about every major broadcasting award, far too many to fully mention, but just let me touch on it by saying, <laughs> very briefly, he's received numerous Emmys as well as six. Alfred I. DuPont Columbia University Silver and Golden Baton Awards. That's the beginning. Uh, Andre Sidiel is a journalist and documentary producer. He co-produced The Judge and the General, uh, which was nominated for an Emmy and received also a DuPont Columbia Award for Excellence in Broadcast Journalism. Most recently, he produced Rape in the Fields, a collaboration also between Frontline and Vision, the investigative reporting program, and the Center for Investigative uh, Reporting. Uh, Dafadil Altan is a bilingual video producer at the Center for Investigative Reporting. Uh, her reporting has re appeared widely in many different media uh, outlets from Mother Jones, the Los Angeles Times, the Chronicle, uh, and elsewhere, including Telemundo and New American Media. She's received awards from the Los Angeles Press Club, the Society of Professional Journalists, and the Imagine Foundation. So with those introductions, I'd like to begin with the question, what made you do the documentary? You want to, want to oh. We were doing another documentary uh, called Rape in the Fields uh, about five years ago now when we started, uh, four or five years ago, and we were interviewing uh, the head of the, uh, the, the chief counsel for the EEOC uh, in San Francisco region, in downtown San Francisco, right near the Embarcadero. And uh, he was describing, because he was a pioneer in bringing cases related to sexual violence in the field in California. And while he was talking with us, he mentioned, and by the way, over there at the ferry building, uh, a janitor was raped and began to tell us the story of this woman who was raped on the night shift. And that was in the back of our minds while we were doing the, the story about the agricultural business nationwide and the question of sexual violence. And so we, we decided we'd come back and look at that, and it led to this. The little bit, the context in which uh, we were told the story was that uh, Maria Bohorquez, who you saw in the film, uh, her settlement amount, I believe, was, was close to a million dollars. It was, it was an $800,000 range. Uh, but uh, Bill Tamayo's point, the lawyer, was that uh, across the street in one of the financial building, uh, there was, was a partner in a law firm or a woman who sued for sexual harassment, nothing near as grave as rape and received, you know, countless billions of dollars. And so he was using it as an explanation of the, the differences in, in, in settlement money that, that women get um, for the abuses they suffer. Uh, I, wasn't, I was not there for the genesis of I mean, I, I worked on Rape in the Fields a little bit, but I, I started working on this based on the tip that they had gotten. And we, as a team of reporters, started, I mean, this was a landscape that there was no other reporting that had been done. Um, there was nothing that we could find as reference, so we had to start our research and our reporting from scratch, essentially, because it didn't exist. So 
that was, I mean, we started with a story that really hadn't been covered or done, except for, you know, the isolated coverage of my younger brother's case. Are there questions or brief comments? Uh, over here. Okay, we can start here, and then we'll move back over here. Well, in some situations, uh, with some crimes, uh, law enforcement's more vigorous in investigating the accuser than the accused. Has that been alleged in, in, uh, in this kind of crime? Um, well, I mean, in this, when we showed this film, there aren't a lot of criminal prosecutions, and you saw the, the DA in, uh, in Hennepin County explain, well, there's not physical evidence, so what can we do? That's a, we found that to be a pretty common attitude among law enforcement who are, uh, feel like they have to have physical evidence to prosecute crime. So what we did uh, was to look at both the civil angle, but then also the role of the employer. So in the case of Leticia Zuniga in Minneapolis, that was basically what, uh, if you go back and look at their investigation, and we had Bill Stasekul, the senior vice president, on there, their investigation focused on investigating her uh, and, and trying to find out, uh, gathering, you know, basically gossip about her, her sexual history uh, and just believing pretty much wholesale what their supervisor was telling us, was telling them. So what we found was, was a pattern in which the, the companies were taking the word of their, their supervisors and, and investigating the, the, the women to try to find holes in their story. That was, that was pretty common. Usually the company defense is that if there was sexual activity, it was consensual. And so you, you, you're left with the burden of having to prove that it wasn't consensual. And uh, in criminal prosecutions, uh, about 7% of cases that lead to convictions without DNA evidence. So if you don't have DNA evidence, then it means somebody has to report and the rape kit has to be analyzed, which is also a huge problem. There are hundreds of thousands of them that haven't been touched that are in storage across the country. Um, it's very difficult, or at least prosecutors feel it's very difficult to bring a case. I think what the senator was talking about is the increasing uh, uh, sense that you can make cases, particularly in the armed forces, they have been making cases without uh, physical violence. But if you're talking in this population, like it was death row, but in this pop population, people are afraid to go to the police, or they don't want to lose their job, or how do we prove it, or you know, we've heard about families where they don't want to admit to their family that this even happened because it's a disgrace. Um, I was just gonna say that there are also you know, there are prosecutors that are uh, working to try to shift um, the dynamics where do you think, you know, where she was also saying is that the testimony does, it is evidence. And some of the research they've done has also identified that in cases of sexual assault and rape, the, the percentage of women who are lying is, uh, I think, between 2 and 8 percent, which is the same for victims of other violent crimes. So, um, you know, the, the, the people are essentially often telling the truth. And there's also a huge problem, just one last point I'm trying to prove this in a criminal court, is that the way trauma victims retell their stories, uh, if you imagine that there's trauma in the brain and there's adrenaline throwing, flowing through your mind, what it does is it doesn't allow you to write down memories in a chronological order. So often the most basic questions a law enforcement officer might ask, where were you before you went there? What did you do when you were going up the stairs? Those kinds of things become very fuzzy. And as the story is told, those inconsistencies will come out. So it makes it very difficult to, uh, for, for prosecutors to use that evidence. Yes, sir. Hi, um, we are, we are uh, an organization that works with a lot of worker organizations around the world. And the question I have is this piece about sharing victim stories and it being an organizing tool. And I don't know if you can just give like one or two points. I mean, it's really hard when you have this kind of, just really kind of cringing kind of stories that are hard to share really openly and widely, especially when they name like rape and 
something, right? You can't be like, I'm going to go to this film called Rape, you know, whatever the two uh, projects you've had. So if you can share some pointers that we could share with our networks about how to bring the stories in ways that really can get a lot of attention and a lot of action behind, um, you know, getting more action with this, this important issues. Um, you mean in the sense of trying to get the story out to more victims or more Yeah, how do you like, choose different parts of like how you, what, you know, you always end up choosing different kinds of content to share, right? Like you didn't, you know, I'm sure you have lots of uh, film, but you chose it to tell it in a different way uh, to make it more appealing for a broad audience. So sort of what are the like, one or two pointers that you could share, um, that we could share with our partners that work with victims? And your partners work with victims. So in terms of, um, I'm just trying to get clear in terms of if they wanted to, you know, get gather stories themselves. Yeah. Do you mean? Or, yeah. I mean, the, the challenging part of our of, of of this is that we all of the victims or survivors that were portrayed, um, we had to corroborate, figure out a way to try to corroborate their stories ourselves because of the nature of the conversation around rape is happening in the country right now because uh, we have to prepare ourselves for information that we wouldn't know. So, um, you know, we, we, these were documented cases. So, um, you know, there are some victims that we met that didn't have any other supporting documentation. And so if we're going to uh, put someone on camera that is, is going to make an allegation and there's not a conviction attached, a criminal conviction, then we also have to involve the other party and give them an opportunity to defend themselves. So our responsibility as journalists isn't um, wasn't only to gather narratives, it was also to try to find as much truth in those narratives as possible because we are going to be held to a different standard um, than someone, for example, gathering stories uh, just to share among other um, uh, victims, which is also important. Um, and it's just a different kind of work. So what we had to do with each one of these um, women in each one of these cases was um, check, you know, their police reports, check depositions, um, you know, look, read through the court records, identify the perpetrator, go to the perpetrator and give the perpetrator a chance to speak, check with the company, find out what kind of investigation the company did. So there was a lot of background, um, the uh, background work and reporting that went into really essentially um, broadcasting each one of these individual stories. So because we had to, we had to report against ourselves because you can't um, even, that was the other thing that was important about um, identifying women that might be willing to share their stories on camera and show their face because there is something about putting your name to a story where the, the, the viewer is allowed to make a decision about whether they believe the victim or not. Um, and so when, you're have, when you have people in shadow, it can be anyone. It can be anyone saying anything. And so it's harder to trust that. And so it was important for us to try to get uh, people who would be willing to tell their story on camera and show their face because then you allow the viewer to come to their own decision and you also, I mean, there is something to putting your name and your face to a story that you're telling. Um, I mean, in a lot of ways, these women were, the, were, were, were extraordinary in that if you think about most percentage of how many people aren't going to report in the first place, and then you're talking about a very small subset, very small subset that would go to the police or that might file a lawsuit, then go through the process and actually reach some sort of settlement, we're talking about a very tiny percentage of women. So, and then agree to go on camera. Uh, so these were very, uh, these people were extraordinary, they were not, not normal. So how do, you, how do you get that message to the populace, right? I mean, that's kind of the issue. So I think uh, what we've done here, you know, we did an English version for Frontline, we've also done a Spanish version for Univision. So one of our plans is, this is kicking off our streaming tour, uh, is to start using the Spanish language version uh, for Spanish speaking audiences as well. And then we did a print story in English and in Spanish, and then we did a radio story in English, and now we're doing, we're just finishing the radio story in Spanish. So it's also, you know, amplifying these voices as much as possible because it was, it is extremely rare, and they are extraordinary. It's, it was, 
it, it was very challenging to get all of them. And actually, uh, as we try to do these Spanish language screens, one of the first challenges that I ran up against was, what time do we screen? Because if you're trying to reach janitors, they're going to work right now, right? So when do you have the screening? You know, maybe Saturday at noon. We'll have to do a different screening time. Yes. Yeah, I, I wanted to, uh, I was thinking along the lines of Univision, but I think what that woman was doing on that radio program, I think it's even more, um, you know, more effective. And I think that might be a way of, of sharing, uh, at least for other janitors to realize this is a crime, even if you're undocumented, you do have rights. But it's sort of a, a, a related question, it seems that these women obviously are extremely vulnerable. And you have these subcontractors. I mean, here at Cal, we probably have subcontractors employing whoever is going to clean here tonight. At what point is the responsibility of Walmart, Berkeley University to check on these women irrespective of who is who the bosses or who is contracting them to come around and say, is everything okay? Even though UC Berkeley is not directly employing them. I mean, I think that that would be important. And telling them, even if you're undocumented, you do have rights and these kinds of things you know, rape or touching or any type of harassment is against the policies of this state and this university. Never mind, you know, just dealing with the subcontractor. I imagine also that none of these workers are unionized. So uh, where can they turn? Where can they find that, they, you know, they, that are at a loss with just having to deal with whoever their boss is? I think ABM has a contract with the University of California. Yeah. But one of the things we learned, one of the things that we learned in the process of reporting, because we're, we're starting out with cases that we can document, cases, let's say EEOC cases, civil cases, and so on. And, and that's what we started from in order to have a documentary base. What we learned about the janitorial industry is that most janitors don't work for regular companies. So, and, and as is explained towards the end of the piece that in fact companies like ABM, which is the largest company and other large companies, because these very small fly-by-night operations have a competitive advantage. They don't pay taxes or they don't pay benefits or they, there's a large amount of wage theft. Uh, so they have actually helped fund as part of their union agreements, particularly in Southern California, this group that goes door to door and, and tries to find out what's happening. So the reality is, is that you get into the whole area of trap, what we call subcontractors and fly-by-night operations, the underground economy. And, and it's in that underground economy that we're now working and looking for the next chapter. Um, and, and, uh, but the conditions there are going to be, from what we can see, unless there's a criminal case, because that's where you'll find the criminal cases, but unless there's a criminal case, there's even less you can find out, fewer people who are going to talk. So, but this is, a, this, this is a phenomenon that's grown in this country, not just with a larger number of undocumented workers and immigrants, but also because we've had more and more outsourcing and deregulation throughout the economy. So no one, no one counts, no one looks. Uh, when we were interviewing the uh, FBI official who was in charge of uh, human trafficking in the Civil Rights Division, uh, he said that, he told me he came from the Department of Labor, that's where he started out. He said we had a hundred criminal investigators for the whole country. So you're, you're talking about um, uh, a part of our lives which over the last 30 or 40 years has in a sense the standards have deteriorated regularly because, for example, margins at big box stories are extremely important. And I think most of, many of you may have Notice, for instance, the stories done out of Berkeley, actually out of a labor research organization in Berkeley, that, for example, Wal most Walmart workers are on food stamps. So taxpayers are, are uh, subsidizing their wages. And so that's the reality of the economy that we're in. Yeah, and it, I think it's pretty fair. I mean, we didn't have any statistics to show, but you can imagine that the situation is probably worse in these. Uh, um, 
these fly-by-night subcontractors who, who aren't paying any taxes or anything like that. But we also found that this happens in unionized settings as well. So ABM, about half of ABM's workforce is unionized. Um, and what happens in those situations, because we looked into several, is that often the, the woman who's, who's making the accusation and the supervisor are both union. So that the union is in the position of also defending the supervisor. So a lot of the women that we, we talked to said the union didn't actually help them in this regard. So it was, it was, it was kind of a sticky subject there, but, um, but from, from after we did all of our research, it, it was at least, well, at least there is somebody to talk to, right? At least there is a union, because most of these places, there's just some guy with a truck or, or something like that. There's nobody to go to. Uh, everything's under the table, and it's just completely off the books. Uh, just a very brief comment on one dimension of this. There's a, a recent National Labor Relations Board ruling that clarifies and expands the meaning of joint employer. So if someone hires ABM to be their contractor, and then something like this, a rape or an abuse takes place, then that company that hired whoever it is can't simply say, well, it wasn't us, right. it was the contractor. They are viewed in terms of liability as a joint employer. This is, of course, being appealed now in the courts, but it is a major decision that directly impacts the what is target for us. Okay. I mean, we, we, all, we were asking these questions because with that the Ukrainian case, we wanted to know what they knew, and target said, and I was reaching out to them, I wanted to give them a chance to comment, we wanted to interview them, and they said, oh, well, we would never employ these kinds of practices, etc. but actually the person who knew something about this is gone and here no longer, and there's just no one that can comment who knows anything about this. I mean, and this was just a sort of, you know, scratching and asking and, and wanting just some basic comment around a very well publicized case. I mean, it was, it was, it got press attention, so. And, and the FBI did not go up the ladder. It didn't go yeah. beyond the, the labor contract. And so, Walmart just never, never Yeah, they, Walmart they didn't, respond. They didn't respond. Although, around the same time that this case happened, uh, Walmart's, uh, Walmart's outlets in western Pennsylvania were all raided. I don't remember how many tens of thousands of people working there were, uh, were shown to be undocumented. So, they're, hmm? and they knew, and were fine. But, um, you know, there, there just isn't a lot of pressure. The pressure is to keep the prices lower, uh, the goods moving, and not to take care of who it is who's working for you. And as long as that system continues and no one covers it, and there's very little coverage, obviously, you know, if you watch 60 Minutes or you watch uh, even the, the sort of better television programs or read a newspaper, there's very little entrepreneurial journalism about uh, people who aren't making good money. It just doesn't happen for all kinds of reasons. Yes. Well, thank you very much for this very powerful and disturbing uh, film. Uh, I haven't had a chance to see your other, the previous one, um, Raven film, uh, but then I'm just wondering if you can help us to just compare these two different kinds of rapes and you know, whether in working condition, you know, working in the film, in, in the farm and working as a, you know, uh, as a janitor. You can just do a very yeah, I think one of the things that was most shocking when we got started was how similar it was. Uh, I think when we started with Rape in the Fields, you know, we had this idea of way out there in the countryside in the fields, far away from everybody, tremendously isolated. But how, you know, here in the city, there's everybody around. Um, that was until I started following janitors around. And it's an extremely isolated situation. I mean, it's a building just like this uh, where everybody's gone. And it's dark, um, and there's one other person somewhere who's your supervisor who has keys to all the rooms. I mean, it's actually terrifying. Yeah. Um, and so uh, when I realized, actually, I think the big click in my head was when the uh, janitorial supervisors were also being called foremen, just in the same way they were in the field. So I said, oh, it's still it's the, it's the foreman. It's the foreman with all the people. Um, and so it was, it was more similar than dissimilar. I think for our reporting, what made it uh, easier to report 
is that uh, based on what I could see, that the, the, the people who are working in the cities uh, as janitors uh, might have a little bit more education than the agricultural workers. They might have a little more access to, to media or to other resources. Um, you know, I think in Fresno County, there's there's one lawyer for every 400 people, but in San Francisco, it's like one for every 10. You know, so it's like there's literally just more places to go. Uh, so those people, we, we had an easier time uh, locating people. Um, so that made it better. And I think there was, there was more cases as well. But the other thing for me that was the most striking as far as the difference was that I think a lot of us have a sense that there are um, injustices or that, you know, farm workers have been under, um, been through a lot over the, the decades here, but when you're dealing with a janitor in the middle of a city, a very concentrated and dense city, and in these spaces that we all inhabit every day, whether it's a Target or an office building or a clinic, uh, the, the big difference is that these are spaces that we are all also occupying. There could have been a sexual assault there the night before, and we have no idea. But they're, they're, so their proximity, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's startling. They're not, they're, they're not far removed from us. Um, so that, to me, was, a, was really one of the big differences. But wasn't it, it, it was easier to get janitors to go on camera mm -hmm. in the end than it was the women in the field, or at least from how many people we had to shadow. Mm -hmm. Well, you can talk about how <laughs> Was it easy to get people on camera? <laughs> <laughs> no one would go on camera for the first film, and many people went on camera for this film. No, that's not true. For the first film, there was there was uh, there were there were like three women. One of them was a sexual assault victim, but there was and that was tremendous work, and it was very similar. Actually, it was very similar to not knowing. These are um, vulnerable populations, working populations, and so they are in a crisis situation all the time, all the time. So you, 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 we worked for months to get some of these women uh, to go on camera, and it was uh, phone calls, it was establishing relationships, it was checking in all the time, it was talking about everything except the sexual assault. Um, and anyone who's worked with vulnerable populations knows that this is just a, it's a roller coaster and you don't know what's going to happen, I have the, 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 the background that was useful for me is that my mom herself was a janitor who worked the night shift. That I had not, not until I was talking to woman after woman did I start recognizing a pattern in our conversations and something felt familiar and I thought, oh, I should talk to my mom. And then I talked to my mom about what her life, what her night shift work life was like. I was a kid, I was in junior high school, I didn't, I didn't know what she was doing. And I, I told her about what I was working about, and I told her what we were working into, and she told me that she had been sexually harassed herself. And she corrupt, she became a deep background source for me because she was corroborating a lot of what I was hearing. Um, so I didn't always bring that up with the women I was talking to, but I understood that the, the crisis uh, situation and the, the elements and, and where I felt as a reporter in their list of priorities, I was at the bottom of that list, and so, um, the engagement, and, and what are you asking of people? You're asking them to talk about something that they never want to talk about again. So the fact that they ultimately, and decide to do it, because it had to be their own decision, it couldn't be something that I tried to convince them to do, or that we tried to convince them to do. Um, once they decided, then we would run to the city with our camera, and, because the, they could change their mind at any moment. We would get the interview and we would check in and they would have someone there, a support person there. Uh, but it was a very lengthy process and it was very gradual and we never knew what was going to happen. So it, 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 it feels almost miraculous that this many people, there's no one in shadow. So um, it's pretty remarkable that each of them decided, um, usually for a similar reason, usually to try to help someone else. If this can help someone else, I'll tell my story again. Um, because otherwise, why would you do it? Uh, we have time for one more question. I know we're just beginning the conversation, and then I have a very brief comment. Yes. Thank you for the work on this film. And uh, two brief comments. The first one is on the distinction between the field or the city. 
in the Leviticus text in the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, there is actually a reference to a difference in the way that a rape will be dealt with if it's in the city because you are within hearing shot of someone else than when you're out in the field. It's troubling the way that it, the story is articulated. However, it does mark even in that ancient legal code the fact that you make distinction for the ability to be heard, which is a comment repeated by all of them, that the accused or the, the person who's accused repeatedly says, nobody's going to hear you, nobody's going to believe you. That ancient text seeks to deal with that and recognize that it is important to recognize at times when you cannot be heard or there's no evidence other than you know your word for it. And so it allows for a different way of dealing with it. So I mean, it's interesting to think about how our laws do not reflect a level of sophistication about the fact that in many situations like these, there is no way in which you're going to have a break kit available or have any other evidence than just your word for what has happened. The second comment, if you can comment a little bit about uh, the impact of the kind of caustic rhetoric that we're hearing towards undocumented immigration by you know people as powerful as those running for president and others, what impact does that kind of perception of undocumented workers, most of whom you're saying in this view, you know, both in the fields and in this case are mostly folks who are undocumented, what impact does that have in the way that they are heard and that their stories are believed when the national rhetoric about them is that they are these criminals, these liars? Uh, you know, what was your sense about what impact that has on our ability to prosecute? <coughs> I mean, it's a, it's a tremendous pressure, obviously, in terms of being able to report. Uh, just the whole idea of not only would you not go to the police because you're scared to be reported, um, but that you don't even know that you have the rights so or that those, that exists. Um, you know, a lot of people uh, in the countries that they've come from come from uh, places where uh, you know, government officials are corrupt or you, you know, you're just supposed to do what you're told. And uh, on top of that, a lot of these women uh, that we spoke to, a lot of them had come from uh, abusive relationships or uh, all kinds of terrible things that had happened to them back home or on their journey here. So there's already a lot of trauma going into the situation. Um, I mean, but in terms of, I think, the, you know, there, may, there might be one reason for a woman to speak out to help somebody else, but there's at least six of not two, you know. And usually, number one is don't lose their job. Yeah. Number two is deportation. They kind of go together, you know, but it's like, uh, I need the money right now. Uh, so there's that, and there's, of course, the shame and not wanting to tell people about it. Um, so the undocumented aspect is a powerful part of the silencing, but it's, it's only part of it. Uh, there's, a, there's a lots of forces working at the same time. Uh, but I think that there's, um, I think the undocumented community, from what we saw, and the people that we talked to, um, I think it was said in the, in the last film, uh, are living in, in a constant state of fear. You know, you, you walk outside, you're going to go, you don't know if your car's going to get broken down and the cops are going to pick you up and you're going to get deported. You don't know when you go to work if you're, you know, what's going to happen to your family members. So it's just a constant state of fear that I think just permeates all, all forms of decision making. And I think you were also, um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but you're also asking, in terms of prosecution, how does that affect the perception of the victim? And from what I understand in talking to prosecutors on background, just to, for this story, is that there is a sort of preparation of the victim, that the jury, uh, sometimes there's a certain victim that they prefer, the good victim, right? I think there are, I don't know if there are attorneys here, but this is what prosecutors are telling me that is a challenge of bringing a victim that may have a rocky background uh, in front of a jury that is prepared to really zero in on some of that background and challenge them on that rather than pay attention to their testimony. And so I think that is part of, uh, I think, the, 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 this larger conversation around rape and rape uh, prosecution and, and the law enforcement element is how, how do we deal with a victim um, that is, is not a composite um, you know, woman next door, that there's a preference that I guess juries tend to have for certain victims. And so I think one of our goals in showing uh, all of these women on camera is to, 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 so that they can be recognized as human beings, that you see how different they are, that you see how similar their story is. It's one long story. 
And so you see that the, you know it's it's very it becomes more difficult to say oh it's this kind of woman who you know unfortunately um, in some of the analysis they do uh, that I've read about and talked to prosecutors about you know people analyze other people and say well it's because she's this and because she's that. And one prosecutor told me that there's um, in her in her years of prosecuting rapes and sexual assaults. There is prejudice against um, Hispanic Latino victims in New York, where she's worked mostly, because there's an assumption that they're this way and that way and this way. So if we show these women, you see, oh, it's very difficult to say one thing or another. They're very different from each other. But their stories are all the same. There was, quickly, there was a case in the last film in Yakima, Washington, where 26 women accused a supervisor of attempted rape, sexual assault, sexual harassment. And it went to a federal jury, and the all-white jury decided not to believe any of the 26 women. And one of the arguments from the defense was that these women were in it to try to get a visa. Right? And that was obviously, appeared to have been a compelling argument. So uh, there was a, an article recently in, in the New Yorker by Evan Osnos, who happened to be out interviewing um, members of white supremacy groups across the United States during the middle of the Trump campaign. And uh, he reported back in the article about their reaction to Trump, which was what you're, uh, who's, who's brought to the surface this view that the immigration, the immigrant population is made up of rapists and criminals and so on. And they uniformly said that finally they had a presidential candidate they could vote for. Now, uh, so I think that, that in answer to your, uh, your question, I think that the campaign, the Republican Party campaign, and, and the people involved in it are giving voice to a whole, if you will, subconscious in America that's been uh, afraid to, to speak out directly about how they feel. So no, whether or not that incites more people to say those things or act out based on that uh, is up in the air, or whether or not, in fact, we're finally getting a good sense of who we are. Because in all of these cases, for example, uh, when we say that we say that the companies usually argue that the uh, event was consensual, for instance, and I remember the case involving Harris Ranch where I, I went and talked uh, to their attorney, and as well as spent a lot of time on the phone with uh, John Harris, the heir to the Harris Ranch. Who you pass it on Highway Five all the time, mm -hmm. um, and the and the explanation was that it was consensual. Uh, and even though they lost the trial and they lost the appeal, and at that time that was the largest judgment of its kind in history uh, against the company. So um, I think that it just these are uh, belief systems, uh, long held uh, prejudices uh, that ha have always been there, are there, and are in the background here. And, uh, but on the other side of the coin, just to be a little more positive about this. Uh, the United States is the only country in the world that has an Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and a separate set of laws that covers employment discrimination. So uh, in many, many ways the reason we're learning about this is that we did have our, we have had our unique history that created this agency in 1965 and, uh, and it exists today. Granted, its budget is less than that of one fighter plane, uh, <laughs> and they have to fight for that. Uh, granted, it's the civil law, it's not criminal, and only recently, uh, about two years ago, were they invited into the meetings in Washington of a joint White House task force on human trafficking. Uh, but there are small, so I think in all of this, there are small steps forward. And there are also what may appear to be reactionary steps taking place, but that it, it only can change if people are aware that this is actually going on. And sooner or later, Donald Trump's uh, comb over will come off. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, we're about out of time. One very brief comment. The film really highlights how toxic a combination it is to be nearly invisible and to be the victim of this abuse. But the film also restores the humanity of the people that have suffered this and implicates us all in addressing it. And in that, I think it is really 
an impressive and important achievement. I'd like to thank Andres, Daffodil, and Lowell for being with us tonight, and we look forward to seeing you at future class events. Thank you.